Luke 4, last time we were talking about the temptations which Jesus faced in the wilderness. If you have your, have your note page, we do note the typo. Those all should say at the very top, chapter 4. Some of the older copies say chapter 3. We forgot to change that. So the first paragraph is 13 verses about Jesus being tempted in the wilderness. And we noted in our brief outline that uh, Jesus met each one of those with the proper use of Scripture. Because after Jesus gave an answer by Scripture to the first temptation, what did the devil do? How did he make temptations two and three? Didn't he make it also by scripture? And so uh, he says, uh, well, especially in three, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down for it's written. And so we know the devil was able to find some scripture and uh, promise Jesus or get Jesus to uh, rely on a, hopefully get Jesus to rely on a, uh, a partial and inaccurate misreading of the text. So it's a proper use of scripture. Now we talked also last time about the 40 days in the wilderness and the uh, many times of which uh, there was a 40 day uh, period in the Old Testament. Uh, the uh, time given Nineveh, Nineveh to repent, uh, the time of Goliath's challenge to Israel, the time of Elijah in the wilderness, time of Canaan, the spies in Canaan, but mostly I think probably uh, directly in comparison, Moses' time on the mountain. And so uh, there's a period of 40, and there's a couple of times where 40 years is also a spiritually significant number. After these 40 days, Jesus is being now prepared uh, for the ministry that he's going to have, and he's going to lead the people to a new Israel, and he's going to deliver them. And he went out after his baptism and was prepared for that, and Satan came when we, in this we talked about last time, him being hungry at a time when uh, the flesh uh, would be uh, particularly susceptible to temptation. And we recall what Jesus would say in another place. He said the flesh, he said the, me, the spirit is willing, but what? Flesh is weak. And so here's a time when uh, Satan approached him at weakness in the flesh. He appealed to him. Uh, to his pride and to try and set him on the defensive. If you're the son of God, do this, uh, which uh, anything morally wrong uh, with uh, creating bread. Is that a moral issue for God or Jesus that somehow creating bread would be a moral problem? Did God ever create bread? How did Israel eat for 40 years? Manna. Manna. Where did that come from? The manna mill? Yeah. <laughs> it fell from heaven. Uh, how did Jesus feed 5,000 and 4,000? He made bread. Well, uh, why not just go ahead and make bread here too? And uh, we note that that, again, it was an appeal to him to try to prove something. Uh, we can often put people on the defensive. Oh, yeah, well, if you're so big, do this. If, you're, if you claim this or that, how about you do that? And people do all kinds of stupid things as a result. And so in this appeal, and this is the one we studied last time, uh, Satan brought his first uh, temptation. But Jesus said, you don't live by bread alone. Uh, then we find he said, well, uh, you're here for a kingdom. How about I just give you all the kingdoms? Uh, all of that is uh, given over to me. If you, if you worship, worship me, me, if you bow the knee briefly, briefly I'll let you have, have all of it. it. And, and, of course, uh, this one I think we can probably most easily tell what's wrong with this. It's probably also, and for some, uh, the, the one, uh, for some people, that would be the most tempting. If Jesus doesn't turn stones to bread, how soon is Jesus going to eat? So the first temptation, right? Turn this stone to bread. If Jesus doesn't do that, 
How long until he gets some bread? Well, how long did he fast? 40 days. 40 days. When did Satan come and tempt him? When the 40 days are over. So when is Jesus going to have his next meal? At the time when he's tempted to turn the stones to bread, how far in advance is the next meal? Do we, I mean, did he know that it was going to be 40 days? Uh, well, so Jesus is out there in the wilderness, and when this is over, what's he going to do? He's going to go back to town, right? And so Jesus is, with that temptation, Jesus is going to have bread, have dinner, just about, the, you know, about as soon as he gets back to town, right? When Jesus walks out of the wilderness, comes to the next town, and he says, uh, hello, uh, I would like some, some dinner, please. That, he's going to have dinner, right? Now, that's, can, can a lot of us, if we're about to get a reward, can we, um, can we hold off on temptation for a little while? Because we know that a good thing is coming. Or we know that there's a right way to meet this need soon. Right? Now, though, but, but the second temptation... I will give you all the kingdoms of the world. I will give you splendor and wealth and glory and honor. Is Jesus going to receive rightly and through the will and plan of God? Is Jesus going to receive a kingdom and glory and honor and splendor? He is. But when is he going to get that? After his death. And how long is that? It's... Three, a little over three years away, right? It's three years away. And, and what's on the journey between here and there? Lots of temptation, lots of, of struggle, lots of weakness, lots of tiredness. And at the end, absolute agony. And nobody knows that at this point but who? Jesus knows that, doesn't he? And he knows what it's going to take when this is offered to him. He knows what it's going to take to get this uh, kingdom and honor and glory and, and splendorous things. And it's three years of diligent labor and at the end, absolute agony and death. And now how many people, if they knew, hey, hold on, Matt, the reward is coming. It's only three years away. Not three easy years, three hard years, then a really bad time. Then you're going to get your reward three years from hence. How many would be tempted to say, yeah, I'll just, I just go ahead and take it, but I can get it now. Right? Uh, what's the game show? Was it Truth or Consequences? Where the guy was always saying, I'll give you these $100 bills here, or you can have what's behind your number, you know, whatever, right? And how many people just say, I, you know, I'll just take the money and be done. Right? And a lot of people know that I want it all, and they lose it. And then some, some would, you know, in the game, uh, they would get everything because they'd win. But this temptation, you can have something now easy. Why, why does Satan think that's going to work? Because the whole point of why he came there, he's, he's saying, let's just, I'll just give it to you. Just have to bend a little bit. That's right. Let's make a deal. Right. Maybe that was the name, that was the name of the game. Sure, let's, let's make a deal. Thank you. Matt's bailing me out here on my, my I, TV show. I, <laughs> no, just take care. go ahead and take credit. You're good. Uh, why does Satan think that deal is going to work with Jesus? Has that deal ever worked before? Works since Adam and Eve. It's worked since Adam and Eve. And how many of us have gone for that deal? All of us. <laughs> have, have we ever gone for that deal? I'll, take, I'll just take that bit now. and Yeah, we have. And so he makes that offer to Jesus. And what does Jesus do? Well, uh, Jesus uh, turns that one down as well. And he says, you, would, you should worship only the Lord God. Worship him only and serve him. And so then he takes him up to the, uh, Jerusalem. Uh, to the pinnacle of the temple. And I've always wondered about that. I, uh, taking him to the pinnacle of the temple, that, that's how that gets there, how they go from the wilderness to the top of the temple. Uh, 
Uh, is this a miraculous translation? Uh, if it is a miraculous translation, an immediate translation, either it's God sent them there, which I, that, that doesn't seem right, or is it the only time that the devil ever works a miracle? Because how many times does the devil work a miracle? Miracle has taken place. I'm showing him the showing him the uh, kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. Yeah, that's some kind of. You see that temporal time. I mean, even when he tempted Job, I mean, he was allowed and he had asked permission, but he got allowed him to afflict. Yeah. And those are. I mean, they had some realistic explanation, but there wasn't. That's true. That's yeah, yeah. The the, the direct cause of, of whirlwind and. To, uh, those uh, tornado-like things that came and wiped everybody. Out. Yeah. Okay. All right. That uh, maybe that is that is. So anyway, they're up on the top of the, the temple, and um, then he says, "Well, throw yourself uh, down." And he says, "It's written, he will give his angels charge concerning you or orders over you to protect you. They will support you with their hands so that you will not strike your foot against." A stone. And so uh, that one, uh, that looks like a pretty complete quote of scripture, doesn't it? Uh, there's actually, it's not quite a full quote of scripture. If we go back to Psalm 91, again, we see the subtlety of what Satan does. Psalm 91, 11 and 12. For he will give his angels orders or charge concerning you to protect you in all your ways. They'll support you uh, with their hands so you will not strike your foot against a stone. Uh, you'll tread on the lion and the cobra. Um, let's see. Oh, okay, so if we look at verse 9, the beginning of that, because you have made the Lord my uh, refuge, the most high, your dwelling place, no harm will come to you. You notice that that promise, isn't it based on making the Lord your dwelling place? Doesn't that make these promises based on the fact that you have taken refuge in the Lord? And if he would throw himself off of the temple here and in front of everybody, because who would see that? There's always people in the temple. And the, whatever glory would come from that, and whatever attesting would come from that, um, uh, whatever whatever people would say, hey, look what he can do. Uh, that that didn't come under the the uh, heading of making the Lord your refuge, does it? And so we think about some of the promises that God gives, and aren't basically nearly all the protection promises. Uh, we find through the scripture, aren't they based on this concept of making the Lord your refuge? He is my rock. He's my redeemer. I will trust in him. And if I do that, if I trust in him, how will he treat me? Well, what if we don't make him our trust and our refuge? What if we don't seek him as our fortress? How much protection should we then expect? And so he says, no, you will not put the Lord your God to the test. And so, we're going to not use our powers for ourselves. We're going to not take shortcuts. And we're going to trust in the way and the will of God. And in that way, Jesus, from the scripture, proper use of scripture, Jesus defeats the temptations of Satan. As the text notes, when he finished these temptations, he departed for a time or some translations say, for a season. And so when was Jesus tempted next? Well, he's tempted continually. Isn't he? How often does Satan put evil before him? How often does Satan send people to provoke him and, and to try him and to derail him? And at times even, who helps be the ones who uh, would, uh, by accident, but who would be the ones who might derail Jesus? His own disciples when they follow the will of man. All right, so here Jesus meets at a time of great weakness 
uh, of the body, but not of the spirit, not in mind. Uh, he meets these temptations rightly and properly. Uh, I like this quote. Uh, it's at the bottom of page nine. In, uh, it's in the text from uh, Westcott. He says, it's about Hebrews 2, 18, but it applies here. He says, sympathy with the sinner in his trial, as Jesus is sympathy with us, does not depend on the experience of sin, but on the experience of the strength of the temptation to sin, which only the sinless can know in its full intensity. He who falls yields before the last strength. And so we sometimes think, man, Jesus wasn't tempted like we are. Of course, what does the scripture say? He was tempted in all points like we are, yet without sin. We would say, no, he wasn't, he, he, he wasn't tempted uh, like I wasn't. That Yes, the scriptures say that. But I think what we can, I think, rightly note is he's actually tempted more than we are. Because every time he goes through the entirety of the temptation process. And so you, what do we do when it comes to temptation? Well, we submit. And so you think about a fellow who, uh, Steve, how, I, tell me, I don't know, honestly. How, how long is a wrestling match? I how, match six, minutes. six minutes. And do they all go six minutes? No. Why don't they all go six minutes? Some of them are wiped up around the mat in the first minute. Some, yeah. go, some can go seven and a half, eight minutes. And can you tap out if you don't like how it's going? Can you can you quit? Can you withdraw? You can. You can. You can withdraw. How many of us in the in the ring with temptation? How many of us have tapped out? How many of us have given up? We didn't go the full number of minutes. And then the other guy goes the full number of minutes, and we say about him, "Oh, you didn't have it as bad as I did." I don't know. Maybe he just handled it better. He was better prepared. Or the like. So Jesus goes the full, the full time with every temptation. So with that, he is now going to begin his ministry. And he goes in verse 14, in the power of the Spirit, uh, in, uh, to go preach into the, in the synagogues of Galilee. Now, some of these things. Uh, yes, Steve. Let's get back to his temptation. Satan already knew he was the son of God. Yeah. The demons have already said that. Yeah, they say that. And they know. Christ may say. So Satan knew, but Satan was, was appealing to his human side here. And every time Christ performed a miracle, it was true that he was the son of God. Here is he is being asked to, I guess, kind of turn to a grip with his human side, whether or not he will submit to that weakness or whether or not he will overcome. You also have there in, in Hebrews, we talked about there, in Hebrews 7, where it talks about he doesn't have to sacrifice because he has no sin. He's been tempted in every form like we have. If he had the kind of temptation. If he had fallen, how could he be our intercessor? How could he be sitting on the right hand of God, being our advocate, saying, they've been, I, I know what you've been through. I know what you're going through. I've been there. I, I've done yep. that. How, how could that take place? It, it could. Right. His, his sinlessness is part of the great qualification of being the Lamb of God. To bear the sins of the world, and and we think you know the, those sacrificial lambs, they are without blemish, right? Um, and that's in a physical and ceremonial sense. In Jesus's case, the perfection is in a moral and spiritual sense, and so the the perfect uh, uh, sinlessness uh, makes him qualified to be that. Also, the uh, also qualifies him for the you know. Uh, everlasting life that comes and lets him be the high priest forever because uh, death couldn't hold him. If he'd sinned, what would death be able to do? Because why is there death? Because of sin. Because of sin. And so if he, <laughs> if, if he had sinned, there's so many things 
in the plan of God that would uh, he had he would have been disqualified for, and would not have uh, you know fulfilled the prophecies and fit the types uh, of the Old Testament. So his sinlessness uh, is of the utmost importance uh, doctrinally and uh, consequentially uh, for us. And as you point out, the Book of Hebrews makes makes a big point of it. Well, similar situation with when Christ was before Herod, Herod wanted to see a miracle, not through that he was the son of God, but he just wanted to see a miracle. He wanted to make face for him. Or when the, the soldier said, who was it that struck you? Prophesy for us. Right. It's a very similar temptation. Our American mindset, we would have, our shoulders would have, would have gone back and stuck our chest out. I'll show you. Christ, fortunately, set the example and said, this is God's will that I go through this for you. Yeah, and I don't think you have to be an American for that. What did the Apostle Paul do when they struck him wrongly at his trial? I'll strike you, you whitewashed. Yeah, God will strike you, you whitewashed tomb, you whitewashed wall. And they go, hey, you shouldn't talk that way about the high priest. And what does Paul say? Well, I didn't know. Sorry, I didn't know he was the high priest. And uh, yeah, so uh, it, it's a high standard that Jesus holds himself to, and we're so thankful that he did, right? So that he could be uh, what he is for us. All right, so Jesus then, and as I was saying in verse 14, he goes back to Galilee and he goes to the synagogues, and everybody hears about the things he's doing. It is interesting what it says, he's in the power of the Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is working with him. And the Holy Spirit is empowering him. How exactly we divide the things of the Godhead at this point. What's the work of Jesus? What's the work of the Father? What's the work of the Spirit? Uh, how do you divide those things, Brad? I, I don't try to. I don't either. He, yes. Acts chapter 2 speaks about the fact that he, you know, that God worked miracles through him. Right. Uh, that, that no one can deny. Was that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit? My answer is it was all. Right. You know, and, and trying to dissect that is right. And you know, I, the, particularly the, the resurrection. He's raised in the spirit in the book of Romans. But in Romans 1 4, it's, it's God raised him. And other passages, I lay down my life that I might take it up in John 5. So, uh, yeah, so we have the spirit with him uh, in their unity uh, and empowering him. And so when he says, I and the Father are working, the Jews rightly took that to mean. Uh, not that God's helping me, but that me and God are like in a partnership. And they, they didn't like it. They understood it, but they didn't like it. But we should understand it and appreciate it greatly. All right, so then after going around Galilee to universal acclaim, he goes to Nazareth, where it says he'd been <laughs> brought up. As his custom or as usual, he goes to the synagogue on, this, <laughs> on the Sabbath. And they read from the scroll of Isaiah. And uh, uh, so uh, the reading Isaiah, well, I forgot to put the note here in my, um, uh, in my notes. So exactly what text that is they are reading. Let's see, it's, um, Isaiah 60, is it 61? 61. Yeah, I'm, I need to write that in the, in the notes here. Uh, he's, he, so he's reading just after the suffering servant section. He's reading in the messianic section. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to preach the good news, the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, set free the oppressed, proclaim the favorable day of the Lord. Again, we note Luke uh, constantly uh, talks about the universal gospel. You know, here it's uh, from the quotation, it's for the poor, it's for the captive, it's for the blind, it's for the oppressed. And so he, he is coming. Now, the gospel has helped people in all those conditions. Uh, the gospel help, helps poor people, helps prisoners, uh, helps blind people and the like. But of course, as we've mentioned before, all of these are emblematic, not just of the physical, these physical conditions are emblematic of the spiritual condition that we find ourselves in outside of Christ. What are we spiritually without Christ? Poor, blind, captive. 
And so the, the, the gospel proclamation is coming. Uh, re <laughs> release is, is coming. He gives that, after the reading, he gives it back. And everybody's looking at him, what was exactly that about? And he says, today, as you hear, as you listen, this is being fulfilled. And at first, they are captivated by this. They speak well of him and go, isn't this Joseph's son? And so you think about Jesus as Joseph's son in the little village of Nazareth. Again, not very big, right? Uh, how big are these ancient Galilean villages? They're, they're just a few acres, right? I mean, literally, how many feet did he grow? You know, was, was he uh, a child? And how many feet from this place was he working in a workshop? You know, it's two or three minutes walk away at the most. And to say that he is now coming and to do this, and he is fulfilling the scripture. But then he tells them, he says, and, and this is what he does from time to time. When Sometimes he does it when Jesus will do it. When there's a good response apparently going, but when it's only surface deep, he seems to be intentionally uh, provocational here. He says, no doubt you'll quote the proverb, uh, physician or doctor, heal yourself. And you've heard I've been doing miracles in other places. Do them here at home too. And so uh, why does he... Why does he do that? Why does he kind of go after them? They're, they all seem to have a good, good opinion of him. He's read from Isaiah. They said, how? Oh, the, the, the prophet that everybody likes all over Galilee, the prophet has come home. Why does he need them? Because they need a needle. <laughs> I guess they need a needle. Yeah, I think that's a pretty good answer. Jesus at times will make things provocative and make things difficult. Uh, John 6 might be the, the um, example that comes to mind to me the most. He says, you've got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And what do a whole bunch of people say? Gross. <laughs> That's, yeah. I don't know what he's talking about. I, I need to leave. I'm gone. And even the apostles that day, did they seem to understand it? I don't think they understood much more than the other people did. I barely understand it. I think, you know, every time I teach John 6, I have to make sure, okay, do I understand this? I'm, I think I might. Uh, uh, this time, well, last time I taught this, I thought I understood it. It's hard. So he, he does, he needles them. And he said, you're going to hear, let me tell you, a prophet is not going to be accepted, except, uh, he'll be accepted except in his hometown. Uh, no prophet is without honor, save, save in his home country. And then he gives the example of uh, Elijah during the terrible famine time and, and suffering at the drought uh, back in uh, Ahab's reign. And Elijah only went to uh, the widow's house, which wasn't even in Israel. And uh, so well, Elijah didn't need to do his miracles, which everybody reads about. And, you know, we're so thankful Elijah was able to provide for himself and his gracious uh, host. But he didn't even do that in Israel. And so um, it's just not uh, something I'm going to do here. And I'm not going to name him uh, in Elisha's time. Uh, he, he was a foreigner. Uh, he's the only one uh, that was uh, cleansed of leprosy. And, and so, so don't, don't be expecting to see a great deal of miracles right here and right now. And I don't plan to do any. So don't even ask. And... They're not real happy with that, are they? And so what do they decide to do to Jesus? When he basically says, don't even ask for a miracle. Yeah. Uh, they, 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 they have the honor of being the first people trying to kill him. Dubious honor, but first attempt on his life is at his hometown. They're going to throw him off a cliff uh, if, if they can. And he's just going to pass through the crowd. He's going to make a miraculous escape. And in the John, it's only one recorded in Luke of a miraculous escape like that. But in John's gospel, it's a regular feature. In John, there's three different times Jesus makes miraculous escapes through crowds that are well bent on killing him. Usually with stoning, but in this case, uh, taking him off a convenient cliff. And so, now I have to ask... Why didn't Jesus see that bad reaction coming? 
Oh, he did. Yes, he did. What do we, what do we understand about Jesus' not, uh, foreknowledge of events and Jesus' knowledge of men's hearts? Right. It's full and it's regular. So Jesus knew this was going to happen. So this is an intentional uh, provoking of these people. And we, well, is that right or wrong? We're not told. We have no idea how many of these people would later go back to that exposure to truth and, and possibly uh, the cut to their heart and, and repent. You know, this, this is a thing. Truth has the challenge. Easy to stay on the shallow level of truth, it's easy to accept. We all have to be challenged with something greater, something deeper uh, that, that requires us to make some changes. And so Jesus was, you know, taking them there, not, not just to make them angry, he was right. simply trying to get their attention to realize the messianic prophecy and its application. And obviously, they didn't like it. Right. Well, one of the differences when these provoking things, difficult things come, is the disciples stay with him until they do understand. As these these folks, they're ready to just toss him off the cliff right now. And he could have come, and he he read Isaiah, and I bet he read it well. And, uh, you know, what do you expect in a synagogue? Somebody to read the text and read it well. And what if he would have given a nice little homily about whatever he read from Isaiah? And then, I don't know, just done a minor miracle, right? I mean, it, so, some, somebody around that place had to have a club foot or, you know, a broken arm or something. He does a little miracle. He says, thanks, I'll see you later. And, wow. But what would they have known better about Jesus? And about his ministry, they wouldn't have. And and there there seems to be a great amount of unbelief with these folks. Uh, I I don't know too many folks from Nazareth through the rest of the Gospels, but in Mark three particularly, there's a case of a whole family of folks from this town who don't believe him at all. His family, his family didn't believe him. And so, what do you think the rest of them thought? And so. Uh, we know that his family took a while to, to, to convince. Although, in, in their defense, I have to say, I, I didn't have a brother. I only had two sisters. My sisters were blessed with a brother, but I was not. <laughs> but uh, try to convince them uh, that, you know, I would... Can you imagine trying to convince them I was the Messiah? Can you imagine trying to... Just think about that anybody you grew up with. And uh, so maybe it's especially hard for them, but as he said, the prophet's not without honor, save in his hometown, and especially at his own dinner table and so it took him a while and so he leaves them with this kind of barbed encounter and then he, he doesn't let them do what they want uh, and we think about all the, the the many times that God blesses us by not letting us accomplish the bad thing we thought we should do right that's a blessing of God isn't it that he defeats he defeats our evil purpose and so that we can have a little more time to think and grow all right so then he goes back to Capernaum and Capernaum becomes uh, sort of the home base for Jesus. Uh, it's one of the major cities in Galilee. It's right there on the Sea of Galilee. And, of course, we know that his, uh, as we'll see in the next chapter, uh, the, the core group of his early disciples, uh, the core group of what will become the apostles, they are from Capernaum, and they are fishermen there in that town. <clears throat> and so Jesus went to Capernaum, and there he was teaching again on the Sabbath, they're astonished because his message had authority. And so he doesn't have to, as we've often heard uh, of the teaching of the time, well, Rabbi so-and-so says this, and Rabbi so-and-so says that. Now, uh, there's a reason why we don't quote rabbis, right? We just quote commentators. Anything wrong with quoting the commentators or somebody who has a good point on, on a thing? I hope not. We just quoted Westcott on temptation because he has a good point. Well, we don't make the whole lesson. What somebody else said about it. We don't treat it as authority. Is a, is a thing. I mean, I think they would. <coughs> my understanding is they would treat their these rabbis, these rabbis as yeah. authority. Well, uh, we don't have the exact full 
uh, literature of their time. It's about 200, 250 years after the time of Christ that what we have now as the Mishnah is developed and written down and codified. And uh, the Mishnah, which is, again, it's the oldest set of teaching and commentary on the law. It is just, com uh, it, it is rabbi so-and-so and rabbi so-and-so and this other rabbi refutes and this other rabbi agrees. And it is really authoritative, uh, given as uh, almost as authoritative as the text. So he has great authority as he teaches. And then we know there's a man, and I like the fact that Luke let us know it's an unclean evil spirit. <laughs> I like the fact he had the word unclean there. This translation says unclean uh, demonic spirit, um, as though there were some clean ones, but Luke goes ahead and specifies. And so this man has, a, has an evil spirit, and we're shocked because, well, as modern readers, when we run across this, because how often do we run across in our daily life uh, people with unclean spirits? How many demon-possessed people do we run into? It's not, not, not a thing we do. And then maybe even more so, where, where does he run into this one? In the middle of services. In the middle of services, in the synagogue. And so when we do have a picture of demon possessed and we do have a picture of evil spirits, do we picture them down at the synagogue for worship when Jesus is coming? And so for us, this is just a really... Um, you know, I, I, I think alien type of text. Because uh, we don't go to the synagogue. Uh, we don't run into demon-possessed spirits. And we don't, see, um, we don't see miracles dealing with them. So we've got multiple things stacked up which are just really strange to us, us as moderns. And in modern arrogance, what do some people say about stories like this? I just made up, right? Because is there really demon possession? Is there really miracles? And the modern man says, oh, there aren't any of those. What does Luke, and does, does, is there anything so far in Luke, and as we mentioned, Luke gives this credible telling of uh, incredible events. But does any of this seem like something made up? Or do we, is Luke telling history as much here as in every other part so far? Luke is just giving a, you know, a standard factual recitation. All right, officer, what happened? Well, the demon-possessed man said this. <laughs> Okay, and then the miracle working man did this, and it's just given as it's just given as a reasonable and rational report. And I think if we give justice to the text, that's the way we just have to deal with it. Uh, Steve, did you? Well, then, over here in John two, we got the account of the, of the first miracle that took place there right. at the wedding feast of the Would that fit somewhere between verse thirty and thirty one? Here you're talking about. I've, used, I've, I've generally thought so. I, I think that uh, wedding feast is a really early uh, event. Uh, Jesus had drawn a couple of disciples to him in John 2. Um, and John, at the end of John 1, um, I'm trying to think exactly where it fits. Um, probably the, 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 the scholar who did the best study on that, we probably should consult, but I don't have one with me, is a fourfold gospel. Find out where McGarvey puts things in order, because McGarvey's just almost always right. Not always, but really, really close to always right. Now, we can look that up uh, when the class is over here in just a minute. But uh, I, I'm thinking it's before this. All right. So we'll deal with that next time because uh, the bell is about to ring. And think about the unclean spirit in the synagogue when Jesus went to teach. And uh, think about how uh, the Gospels and, and the Book of Acts as well uh, present these as real, honest facts. And, uh, and how I think it really does a disservice to inspiration and to Luke's great work as a historian uh, to take it otherwise, especially just based on modern 
uh, presuppositions that all such a thing couldn't happen.